Today is April 14th, and my name is Urara Hatano, and I'm today interviewing Mr. Franklin Odo in Washington, D.C. So, uh, I'd like to start with a family background. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about where you were born, where you grew up, and where you went to school? Sure. I was born in Honolulu, Hawaii, mm -hmm. on um, May 6, 1939, in this, within the city. And um, my family moved uh, during World War II into what is now a suburb of Honolulu, mm -hmm. but at the time was pretty country. And uh, so I grew up basically on a, a vegetable farm mm -hmm. in Honolulu and graduated from pub the public school system there in 1957 and um, then went on to, to college from, mm -hmm. from Honolulu. So your parents moved from Japan to Hawaii? No, they were uh, Kibe Nisei. Okay. Th that is to say, their parents were immigrants. And so my, although I didn't know my grandparents, um, mm -hmm. my, my dad's parents um, moved from Hiroshima City. I'm from Hiroshima. Are you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Moved from Hiroshima City to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And um, so he was born on Kauai, actually, mm. um, <clears throat> and he was n not very well, so they took him back to, they took him to Japan, so he was born in Hawaii, mm -hmm. and so he's an American citizen. Um, as a child, he was taken to, to um, Hiroshima, where he grew up, mm. and um, went through the school system there, and went to one year of college um, in, in uh, Tokyo, uh, before returning to, to Hawaii. My mom's family had um, gone to Colorado, where she was born. So she um, was born near Denver, mm -hmm. and was uh, taken to Hiroshima in um, what is what used to be pretty Inaka. It used yes. to be pretty rural. Yes. Um, but Shobara is f actually a fairly sizable city now. Mm -hmm. And as a teenager, she decided she wanted to return to the United States and left in the 30s and um, met my dad in Honolulu. Mm. He got married and that, that's, yeah, so I'm the oldest of uh, four children. So, can you tell me a little bit about your siblings also? About? Your siblings? Oh, sure. Um, my sister, um, I, I have uh, two sisters, I had two, two sisters and a brother. A uh, younger sister, then um, a brother, and then my youngest sister, my youngest sister uh, died, mm -hmm. unfortunately, oh. a few years back. Um, my younger sister, Carol, is um, living with my mom. My, my father passed away some years back. My mom is still alive. She's like 91, mm -hmm. um, so a little frail, but still healthy. And my brother is uh, on the island of Kauai and um, are still working. So most of your family, they still live in Hawaii? Yes. Okay. Um, please tell us one story from your youth that has been an important lesson for today's Asian Pacific American youth. One story from my yes. youth. Well, <clears throat> if I can, can I, can I do it from college? Yes, of course. Okay. So I went from uh, a public high school, which was not very good, mm -hmm. in Honolulu, uh, to Princeton. So that was a major kind of yes. culture change for, for me. Uh, one of the things that was really, really different was being in an entering class of 700, maybe 25 kids who were almost all white, mm -hmm. um, most from fairly affluent families. Um, so it was, it was a very different kind of a setting for me. Uh, no girls. So that was a major adjustment mm -hmm. for me. Anyway, um, one of my classmates and uh, suite mates, we had a, lived in dorms that had a suite um, in my junior year, was a fellow by the name of Robbie Harrison III. And Robbie Harrison III came from Savannah, Georgia. His parents were bankers. So um, mm -hmm. in the spring of 1960, he invited me home with him. So we drove from Princeton, New Jersey to Savannah, Georgia. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
this was a very interesting trip for me because it was the first time I'd been to any place that was um, considered the South. And this is the days of um, Jim Crow um, regulations. So, I, you know, the, the car ride was a way of introducing me to a whole part of the country that I didn't mm -hmm. know very well. Um, for example, driving through New Jersey and then um, parts of Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, you know, it was not that, it was a turnpike and so it was a fairly fast journey. We stopped, I remember we uh, stopped in North Carolina, I used um, to get some gas and to use the bathroom. And, and so uh, I had never seen, a, you know, the kind of Jim Crow stuff that, that existed before, I didn't know about this. Um, but the bathrooms in the back were not male, female, mm. was white and colored. And so one of my, the things was, I didn't know which one to use. Mm. And I said, oh no, if I use the wrong one, you know, do I get beaten up? <laughs> so that was uh, one, one kind of sort of exposure to a, um, a part of the country that I didn't know very much about. So that's a lesson that, mm. that um, I think understanding about um, race relations and the place of Native Americans or in, in, in Indians in, and African Americans was uh, something that became important to me. So before that experience, you didn't recognize yourself as a ethnic person of minority. color? Hardly, you know, the whole Hawaii thing was deceptively, um, at least the, the notion of potential solidarity with other people of color was difficult because um, we grew up in a, a state, yeah, it was a territory then, where, and it's still true today, it, Hawaii has been the only state in the Union which has never had a white majority. Mm -hmm. so, so even though white supremacy was part of, um, part of the, what you grew up with, and that you, you accepted because the newspapers, the uh, cultural facilities, the artwork, the museums, the art museums, your textbooks, everything about the national culture told you that um, th there was prejudice, there was racism. Um, but in the day-to-day -day kinds of work, my um, growing up in high school in the 50s was a, was a watershed era in Hawaii. It's the, it's the period when uh, particularly Asian Americans and Native Hawaiians, but people of color actually through the uh, union movement and the uh, Democratic Party actually took control of some of the political reins, not the economic parts of the society, but, but some of the very important parts of society. So it, it didn't feel like um, I couldn't participate mm -hmm. in the, the political makeup of the, of the you know, of, of the society I was part of. Mm -hmm. So now I'd like to move on to the, uh, your work experience. Okay. Can you tell me a little bit about your work experience, especially mm -hmm. as they relate to being an APA in the United States and the DC area? Sure. You know, I, after I graduated from college, I went to um, a, a master's program at Harvard in East Asian Studies. This is 1961-63. What was a major for undergraduate? Oh, history. Okay. I did American history and Asian history. So I had gotten a little bit interested in mm -hmm. Asia, uh, but not, not so much in terms of trying to figure out who I was, but, but more, I mean, I think that was part of the agenda, but I didn't recognize it at, at the time. Um, but my interest in trying to place myself mm -hmm. in the uh, Asian American um, context came about very slowly and, uh, and, I, and I think it begins in that early period but um, so I finished the master went back to Princeton for a, a PhD in history and I did a dissertation on um, Saga Han Saga mm -hmm. the, so feudalism Saga Han. yeah <laughs> specifically on uh, feudalism in the uh, Nabishima Daimyo mm -hmm. So, so um, uh, that took me quite a long time. And I did actually finish that degree, 
but in the meantime, I started teaching at Occidental College in Los Angeles in 1968, and got very involved in a lot of civil rights and um, anti-war mm -hmm. activities. So it was a very radicalizing um, time, period. And uh, so my family was involved in a lot of um, uh, what, what I think would be considered pretty radical activities then. Peace marches, mm. sit-ins, hunger strikes, that, that sort of thing. Um, and this is the 1968-70 period is when a APA, Asian American Studies, begins. Mm. So I was part of that whole um, early period of trying to create a field. Wow. So what brought you to DC? Um, I've been teaching for 30 years okay. and um, was a visit visiting professor at University of Pennsylvania, um, Hunter College, mm -hmm. uh, Princeton, and Columbia for two years. And in that period, 1995-96, the um, Smithsonian uh, leadership uh, invited me to be a consultant to talk about how the Smithsonian should proceed with regard to uh, introducing Asian American Pacific Islander content into the Smithsonian. Mm -hmm. So I became a consultant and, and um, in the process of doing that, they decided they should have a program and asked me to become the director. Oh. So you uh, want to be a founder of that? Yeah. I became the first uh, oh. a director of the APA program. That was 1997, 12, 1997. almost 13 years ago. So before that, they didn't have a specific uh, no. Asian American? No. Yeah, and even you know, through, throughout this whole 12 year tenure, when I left academia and started working here, I was the only senior person who had any um, content, content knowledge about Asian Americans or Pacific mm -hmm. Islanders. So it's still very far behind. The Smithsonian has a huge museum for, for Native Americans, the, yes, okay, right? The American Indian yes. Museum. It's a huge, beautiful building. They have um, planned a National Museum of African American History and Culture. Mm -hmm. It's going to be on the mall, and it'll open to the public in 2015, five wow. years from now. There is in Congress a bill, um, well, there's all, actually the bill created a commission to study the um, feasibility of a Latino museum, and I'm pretty sure that will happen. So in terms of the four sort of major racial groups, our APA group is very, very far behind. Mm -hmm. I, I think we eventually will need a separate museum, um, just because it seems to be uh, too difficult for the established 19 museums to actually incorporate a lot of the APA um, artifacts and resources and history and um, personnel to be able to, to do this uh, on any kind of equitable par with um, other groups. Mm -hmm. So that my, my thinking is that the Smithsonian will have to move in this direction. Yes. I actually did a little research about you on the internet before coming here and I found out that you are the only the first curator at the Smithsonian, Asian American curator yeah. at the Smithsonian. Yeah, no, that's true. And um, presumably this will be, um, since I've retired, um, there is not. Oh. So there are no curators who are, mm. there are curators who are Asian or um, Asian American in, in terms of their descent, but in terms of their content, um, there, there isn't anybody now. Mm -hmm. But they are uh, searching for a repla replacement for me and I think they're scheduled to hire another uh, curator as well. So the number of people who are um, authorities in the field will double from one to two. Good to know. <laughs> Please paint us a verbal picture of one memorable day at one of your jobs and let us know why it was memorable. Oh, let's see. That's a hard one. Get the, um, there are just a lot of different kinds of examples. In, um, if, I can, if I can do two I'll do one from my academic life and one from the Smithsonian. Um, I think the academic one would be um, 
moving, taking the job at the University of Hawaii. This is 1978, 10 years after I started <clears throat> teaching in California. And taking the job as director of the um, Ethnic Studies program at the University of Hawaii was one which was really com complex. Yeah? It was a difficult um, position. And, and um, the, the responsibilities were pretty awesome and daunting. But it was a, it was a way of, of me getting back to home turf and being able to do my job uh, in a, a kind of a context that I sort of understood, although it had been changing a lot since I left. Um, but that, that was, I think taking that job was one sort of turning point in, in, in my academic life. And it grounded me in a way, it, it taught me the limits of um, what I knew and how, how difficult the, the sort of the future responsibilities would be for, to try to create this, this field. Um, at the Smithsonian, I think the most recent sort of memorable, memorable day was uh, bringing together the Indian American uh, community. We've, we've had, in the 12 years that I've been there, we've had specific projects on um, the six major uh, nationality ethnic groups, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Filipino, Vietnamese, uh, were the five, and Indian Americans were the sixth. Um, and you know, one, one of the things that's been interesting in my career from 1970, say 1970 census to the 2010 census, is that in 1970, Japanese Americans were the largest single Asian ethnic group in the country. Today, in 2010, we will be the sixth. So the, the Asian American profile has changed very dramatically as a result of the 1965 uh, Immigration Act changes that, that took place. So, adding the um, Asian Indian group to this group of projects that we have um, completed and the, the, the Indian group is one that, that just began. I think when we got the group of a, a dozen families together and toured part of the American History Museum and then went to a, an Indian um, restaurant in Cleveland Park and uh, this was part of their fundraising um, event to see whether we could generate uh, support from the community to, to do an Indian American project, an, an exhibit, a website, mm -hmm. curriculum, and public programs. And for that, we, we hoped we could raise a couple of million dollars. Uh, that evening, uh, some people stood up and said, oh, you know, I'm great, we're going to join this founder circle and donate $2,500. And uh, by the end of the evening, we had, we had um, raised about $93,000 wow. in one dinner. So I knew it would be a success and I, that was a great that was a great feeling to know that our work had generated that kind of yeah. uh, support from yes. the community. Wow. So that was a great day. Mm -hmm. I think now we can <clears throat> move on to community involvement. Um, please describe your life outside of your paying work, either at community groups, religious groups, professional groups, or other groups. So besides oh boy! Work. You know, my sort of my community involvement has, for a very long time, been through my work. True. There and you and you know, from uh, from the time certainly that I left um, UCLA in '72, started working with the California State University system, the, the nature of Asian American studies and then ethnic studies at uh, the University of Hawaii, of Hawaii um, that academic research and teaching was predicated upon um, direct involvement with community needs and community uh, requirements and direct communication with community uh, people. So. Um, in a, in a funny way, I didn't have a community life outside my, because mm -hmm. it, was, it was pretty much all consuming. And here, um, it, 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 the jobs differed um, and the involvement differed because 
say, take a place like Hawaii, um, my, my community involvement there included quite a number of grassroots um, groups uh, fighting for um, land, uh, trying to get better educational uh, access to uh, resources, uh, talking to state legislators, that, that sort of thing. So uh, pretty down home, pretty grassroots. At the Smithsonian, the community, the community would be um, congressional um, representatives, um, congressmen from California, from from, Was from Washington State, um, the White House, um, leaders of the Japanese American Citizens League, the National Japanese American Memorial Foundation, the Organization of Chinese Americans, um, leaders of the Asian American Journalists Association. So the community is very different. They're, they are um, people who are in charge of national organizations and they're headquartered in mm -hmm. DC. So they're not like common folk, uh, but, but for us, they are the community that we need to support um, out of the Smithsonian. So you got involved in the community very much through your research and yeah. work experience. Right. Okay. <clears throat> After being involved in the uh, APA community, do you see any change inside the community over the years? Oh sure, lots of changes. I mean, if you if you um, if you go back like me to 1970 or 1969, I mean. Uh, the nature of the communities has shifted. Just the, the example I gave you that it was that Japanese Americans were the largest group at the time and now we're the smallest group among the six major groups. I think the expansion of um, inclusion of, of more people like Southeast Asians and South Asians and even West Asians so that Af Afghanis, uh, you know, Af people from Afghanistan, from Tibet, particularly in, in the D.C. area, where you have uh, folks like uh, small communities, to be sure, but communities who are from Mongolia, or Tibet, or Bhutan, uh, or Burma, um, is, is very different from, um, you know, the, the, the la latter parts of the, of the 20th century. So even in the last 30 years, there's been a huge change in who gets represented, what concerns there are. The whole thing about immigration, for example, and uh, undocumented people um, is, is something that wasn't um, so clearly articulated in, back in the 70s or 80s. Um, things like transnational connections, the fact that people now can travel back and forth uh, so rapidly, uh, keep in touch with tweeting, Facebook, uh, sending you know Korean um, soap operas, that, uh, that that sort of thing is where people can come here, settle here, keep in touch with the home country, and still uh, consider themselves part of America, is a very very different thing. So it's getting more diverse in our dimension. Yeah, yeah, and and I and I think. This is why um, there, there is such a, I, th I think there's some anxiety among, for example, African American communities, mm -hmm. partly because being overtaken in numbers by Latinos, for, mm -hmm. for example, um, but in, 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 in the white community in particular, I think there are segments where this, this has so rapidly changed from the America they knew in the 50s or 60s. And um, the feeling that, that white people were, were, you know, just generally in charge. And, and, and the sense of um, this equilibrium, I guess, of angst that um, the, the United States they knew um, is slipping from their grasp, I think is, it brings us into a very dangerous and very unsettling time. Which I, you know, I think is the sort of the um, motivating thing behind things like the Tea Party movement and people. And so, where where Obama, you know, the the, the election of Barack um, 
tempted many people to think that we're in a post-racial kind of society. Uh, I think it's absolutely wrong. I think I think it's I think it actually has exacerbated racial tensions and um, made people feel um, th that they're losing touch and they're, they're losing control of their country. Mm. And, and, and so in a way, um, it's heightened uh, the racial tensions. Um, going back a little bit to the uh, community involvement, mm -hmm. what have these experiences added to your life and to the lives of the other APIs? Did it change your life? Your personal life, being involved in the community, I mean, it's part of your work, but like, did it affect the way you see yourself? Or Say again. Uh, yeah. Being involved in the uh, oh. community, did it change the way oh, sure. you see yourself or your <clears> personal <throat> life? Oh, I'm sure it has. It has, I mean, because um, where if I had gone into um, Japanese history, and teaching Japanese history and researching Japanese history as an academic, um, I, you know, my guess is I would have maintained a fairly traditional kind of way of looking at um, be, becoming an expert in the field and being, um, to a certain extent, able to maintain a distance because that's the hallmark of, um, has been anyway, uh, for for a very long time. For most academics, the, the a primary value is to maintain a distance from between yourself and your subject mm -hmm. and objectivity. The critical part of Asian American studies, ethnic studies, for many of us has been the uh, integration of the researcher and the subject so that so that we unabashedly say we're not a, not objects. We try, of course, to be academic, to be analytical, um, but but the key is to understand and advocate for and provide a means for the rest of society to understand, say, an Asian American community, and to uh, provide a link that is at once scholarly, but at the same time direct and. Uh, not just simply empathetic, but integrated. So that, that part, I think, has um, made a huge difference in terms of how I approach uh, being a scholar or being an academic and um, trying to uh, do my work. Now the Folklife questions. Mm -hmm. The staff of the 2010 Symphonian Folklife Festival will be inviting dancers, musicians, material artists, storytellers, crafts makers, calligraphers, language teachers, and those who have participated in historical APA groups or experiences to help us tell the story of Asian Pacific Americans next summer on the National Mall. Please describe what you would want to share with the audience at the HEF Festival. Personally, what I would share. I. <clears throat> well, one of the things I, I know Phil is doing this and he's doing a good job um, with a, within a limited number of tents that I think we have four um, to try to be as inclusive as possible even if it at the risk of um, doing only token um, inclusion of some of the smaller groups um, I think it would be useful because we're, we're doing at least two different really important things here to, to bring the APA communities onto the mall and um, because we're documenting them um, it, it's, it's a way to do in the, in the year of the census it's really important and timely to say okay this is the approximately 350,000 people of Asian American Pacific Island their descent in the DC metro region it's a way to get a snapshot of, of this very large and very complex and very diverse uh, community so that if another folklife festival in 30 years or 40 years uh, in 2050 takes place that has a similar kind of focus uh, it'll be it'll be interesting to see what has changed mm -hmm. in, in that period and be, because it be, would have been really nice to know um, 40 years earlier in 1970, when Asian American studies began, 
what the EPA demography was like in Washington, D.C. It was very different. We, we know it was very different. And we have some clues, but to have uh, performers and storytellers on the mall, um, you know, t telling what it's like to live in a community then would have made a great uh, comparison and contrast. So, so I hope we... Storytelling. No, yeah, so storytelling. Real storytelling. Real storytelling about... I think it will be important to have folks who can who can um, describe and you know and in, a, in, a, in soft analysis, not not academic kind of uh, ways, but to really talk about who we are and mm -hmm. how this matters in terms of the Washington scene. And for that, I think you will need to have folks who are sensitive both to the fact that this is the nation's capital and this is an international uh, gathering and um, uh, that, that we have dozens and dozens of different groups represented here. And to really kind of uh, take a look at um, both broadly and deeply uh, uh, as we move along. So, I mean, I think this kind of the video history stuff is really useful because mm -hmm. not all of us can be on the mall and we can't be on the mall all the time. So this sort of uh, recording, I think, is um, a really good idea. It definitely lasts forever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned that Asian Americans are still the mi minority of yes. the Smithsonian's. What was your first reaction when you found out that the uh, Asian Americans would be one of the topics for the Folklore Festival? Oh. Were you happy or surprised? I was, I was very happy. I mean, <laughs> I've been working, our, our program um, has been working with the Folklore Center for a very mm -hmm. long time. And um, in fact, when I was in Hawaii still, in 1988-89, um, the Folklife Center came to us. I was then the chair of the Hawaii Arts Council and um, um, broached the subject of Hawaii being represented on the mall. Because periodically, the, fest the summer festivals have featured um, a state. Mm -hmm. And so they were thinking about featuring Hawaii. Hawaii as a state. So I worked fairly closely with uh, the uh, uh, Folklife Center uh, uh, staff then. So I knew about them. And, uh, and I, I knew that something like this might become a possibility one day if we work closely enough. And I had a lot, I had a lot of respect for my colleagues there. Mm -hmm. I think they're a good, a good group. Um. You said that you used to work as a teacher, and there's a question. A festival will feature those who can teach as well as those who can perform. Mm -hmm. What is your background and experience as a teacher? So you've been a professional teacher for a while. Uh, yeah. What were yeah. your teachings then? Uh, Asian American history. Uh, broad history or specifically? You what know, it, in Hawaii, um, where I taught for the longest time, I taught a course on the Japanese in Hawaii, because the Japanese Americans were mm -hmm. still a very large um, group there. Um, here uh, on the East Coast, I've had to try to be a little bit more um, broadly based and um, so taught Asian American history at places like Penn or Columbia or, or um, Princeton in a seminar. But at College Park, I taught a, a one course a year um, until several years ago, and that was more specifically Japanese Americans and World War II. Mm. And that the whole thing of the imprisonment and what I consider ethnic cleansing of people of Japanese descent from the West Coast, um, it, you know, there's so much literature, so many documentaries, and so much research that's been done that uh, it's easy to devote one seminar to that, and it could be uh, many, many years actually of research. So I, I did that for several years at College Park. Enjoyed it very much. We actually read a book written by uh, Mina Okubo. Yeah. Citizen, I forgot the number. One three yeah. six six yes. zero. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, she was a great artist. I have one more question. You said that you were pretty much involved in the uh, radical activities in the nineteen sixties in California. Yes. Could you tell me what it was like back then? Well, you know, it was, for me, it was probably a little bit irresponsible. I was a husband and a father. I, we had a couple kids. 
So it was, it, there was no field at the time. So 1968, um, some of you know about the, the student strike at San Francisco State, which was followed by one at Berkeley. And those two campuses in Northern California um, really led the way. And then there were strikes um, and student activism at places like UCLA and Columbia as well. So there's a national kind of movement to, um, and I, I guess the, 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 the national atmosphere was volatile. It was very, um, I guess dangerous is the, is the word. People felt that um, the, because there were, there were riots uh, in, the, in the cities, um, you, you know, Kennedy, John, Jack Kennedy had been had been assassinated in '64. Uh, Bobby Kennedy and, Mar and Martin Luther King Jr. had been assassinated in '68. I mean, there were people um, burning down parts of the cities. Um, folks who were trying to confront the military to keep them from going to uh, Vietnam. Uh, the you know the. Native Americans were occupying Alcatraz, you had Wounded Knee. It was a hugely, it's, it's, it's really difficult to sort of evoke that time. Even the books that I've read um, and documentaries that I've seen um, d don't evoke for me the realities that we were living um, through. Partly because the, most of the books and documentaries uh, focus primarily on white-black relations. And while, you know, our heroes at the time, our models, were not so much Martin, but uh, Malcolm. So Malcolm X and, and, you know, whatever is necessary, the Black Panther Party. And, and you know, with, the, with hindsight, we could see there were some things that were not the best, and we underestimated the value of people like, and, the, and the courage of um, Martin Luther King Jr. So there's lots of stuff that's changed in my thinking, but um, people, people who were um, confronting uh, imperialism or colonialism uh, through direct action, um, Mao Zedong, for example, uh, whose excesses now, or Stalin, you know, who, who we would never now consider to be uh, models or heroes. But at the time, um, these were very attractive people whose writings and, and sayings uh, many of us were uh, influenced by because it was a call to action. Mm -hmm. And it didn't look like the, you know, the Republican Party or the De Democratic Party or people who were involved in politics, even the ones who were fairly radical, radical like like um, McGovern, uh, the peace um, people, um, were doing enough. And so, so taking to the streets and trying to, trying to um, capture the places where we were working, like university campuses, became um, an attractive alternative as a way to try to uh, change the society. And people, you know, uh, it's not, this is a very different kind of a feel than people who got involved with Barack. And, you know, si se puede, you know, yes we can, change is possible. And there was, there were some changes made, but the, the degree and the intensity and the nature of change that we were trying to create at the time um, was closer to revolutionary than anything um, the president, I think believes in. He's a fairly moderate. I mean, he would have been, <laughs> he would not have been a hero to us. <laughs> and it's, I, I believe in him. I, I think he's doing very good stuff, given, given the constraints and all. But we were after a much bigger game. And, uh, you know, it didn't work out very well, I don't think. Um, although the, the level of comprehension uh, in terms of understanding the nature of our society, and and um, what what kinds of change is required um, to get, for example, really good health care, um, or to eliminate poverty, 
um, those things are not possible given the, the, the construction of uh, society as we, as we know it today. And, and in that period, people were seriously studying that. And I don't think very much of it is going on today, you know, in, in terms of really deeply thinking about where we are, who we are, and where we need to be. So um, we, may, we may need another period like that. <laughs> mm, at last, I have one more question. I suppose as a curator, you have uh, directed many exhibitions at the museum. Could you tell me one of the exhibitions that you organized that was very memorable for you? Oh boy, um, they all have been. Uh -huh. for, for, it's like asking a, a parent which one of your children do yeah. you favor most. Because <laughs> they're all sort of, you know, they're very different, they have different temperaments, mm -hmm. and they have different shortcomings. Um, but, but there have been a dozen or so that, we've, that I've been personally involved with, so they're all very special. Do you think the exhibitions that you organize have changed the uh, uh, community? You know, you'd like, like to think so. Or? Hmm. Uh, not, not as much as uh, we'd like to. There are certain constraints uh, in terms of how far you can go, what you can, what you can do with them. And um, we certainly have more modest kind of aims and goals than the 60s and 70s now. So for example, um, in, in doing the different exhibits, including the Indian American one that's, that's just beginning, I, I think the, 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 you know, the, the motivation for that and the goal for that is much more modest. And we're not trying to radically change people's mm -hmm. thinking. But what we'd like to do, I think, is um, let the community, the Indian American community, for example, know, and the non-Indian community, and know that this is a very important part of our history. Um, empower the Indian American community to feel, to, to really honestly feel that its experiences and diversities are important enough for the Smithsonian to notice. So that when, when you get a national, um, you know, the, na the nation's museum to pay attention, then I think it validates people in, across mm -hmm. the country to really believe um, you know, their stories are worth uh, telling yeah. and listening to. Definitely. So hopefully that that's the main thing that we want to get done. Thank you very much. You're uh, welcome. Is there anything you want to add to our previous conversation? No, I think I think you guys are doing great. So um, I hope you, you 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 can do a bunch of these with all kinds of different people. So when you when you make a list of the people that you're planning to interview. Uh, think about um, what you're missing. Mm. And, and cover see. all kinds of fields. Yeah. 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 Um, if there is one statement you would want to make your grandchildren and their generation, what would it be? Boy. <laughs> um, I, for, for me, I mean, I don't have anything, I, I certainly don't think I have anything to say. I, I do have grandchildren. Two of them, and uh, <clears throat> even even now, I'm not sure that I have words of wisdom for them. I think what, what I can say is um, it's been a it's been a interesting life, and uh, the you know the ancient Chinese had a saying, "May you live in interesting times," because for um, classical Chinese anyway, anyway uh, one of the um, Lao Tzu, anyway, this is, this is from the, the Taoist kind of tradition. Um, the best life possible was to stay in your village and live out your life in a calm and unturbulent kind of way. So interesting times are times of war and chaos and difficulty. Mm -hmm. so, so may you live in interesting times is a curse. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> if you don't like somebody, you tell that person, may you live in interesting times. Because <laughs> the good times are really relaxed and, you know, I, I don't seek that. I actually yeah, yeah. think interesting times is good. 
Yeah, because do you truly appreciate the calm life? You have to experience the interesting time yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we're done. Thank okay. you very much. Oh, you're welcome.